Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of international business. Now clearly that's a very broad topic and it can pull from a lot of different areas of business, finance, marketing, sales, uh, and, and economics. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna do something a little differently than I do in most of my presentations. Usually I just give you a few samples and then I walk through some examples here. But because I wanna cover a lot of breadth here, uh, I'm going to be a little bit more brief. It's going to feel a little bit more like a laundry list and a little bit lighter on the explanation. Um, but the reason for that is I want to give you uh, 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 as much breadth as possible in a, in a relatively reasonable amount of time. I do want to point out though, I think that in, in most of my presentations, I would in a live presentation give all of the areas I cover. I think in this one, it's going to be more likely that I would be hired by a certain industry or company that wanted some specific things and so I wouldn't actually cover all of these options we might specify whether they're selling versus outsourcing versus doing public works internationally we, it, the, the the client would probably be interested in one of these and we would just flush that one out a little further and do that one live so that's a, that's a little preface here it's, it might feel a little bit different um, but I think ultimately that's more valuable. Just expect that the, the live presentation, uh, unless you are interested in such a thing, wouldn't cover all of these areas. It would cover probably the select ones. So this is a video sample. You can sort of think of it as a sampler platter. You know, when you go to a restaurant and you order the appetizer sampler, it's got two bites of every appetizer, and then you decide next one which one you want to order. This is a little bit more like that. So since we've got a lot to cover, let's get it started. Um, the first one I want to talk about is, oh, and I should also mention on that, if you're really interested in one of these areas, some of them could be flushed out into their own presentation. So for example, you could probably do a presentation just on the economic considerations of going international or just the cultural considerations. So let's get started. Um, let's talk first about the business model where you're trying to sell into a new market. You're bringing your product or service or business into a new uh, country, essentially. And it's important to note, we're going to talk about that in the context of countries, but sometimes you can think of it in, in terms of market entry as well, maybe a, a new market in a, or a segment in a country you're already in. But the first issue that you'll face is why uh, the reasons for entering this country. Obviously, the, the most intuitive one is probably growth. You want to grow your business, increase revenue, increase profits. Um, and that is uh, oftentimes the reason. It's also important to note, sometimes there's a defensive reason uh, as well or uh, as an alternative. And by defense, I mean if you have uh, a, a domestic market and you have people from other countries, enter, uh, businesses from other countries entering your market, you might want to respond in kind just so that they don't have a safe haven to raise money to fund their investment in your market. And also if there are, that's particularly true if there are scale economies, because if there's a sort of a high fixed cost of production, then, they, then the, the uh, expanding into another market is just a variable cost. And that might put you at a disadvantage if, if, if your domestic market is both your fixed cost and your variable cost. So you wanna make sure that it's not just incremental business to a competitor and therefore better for them than it is for you. Uh, an example of that would be the brewers. A lot of the brewers have been globalizing between a couple of big players like uh, Anheuser-Busch InBev and uh, SAB Miller, which started as South African brewers. Um, and now that they have gobbled up a lot of the best assets internationally, some of the companies that weren't as aggressive um, def uh, in terms of being offense now find themselves on the defense. They're trying to pick up some assets to build some scale to compete with these giants. Uh, the next thing you might want to consider is the means of market entry. Uh, obviously, you can sort of do it yourself and try and set up a wholly owned subsidiary and your own distribution channels and warehouses and, and whatnot. But oftentimes, that's the, that certainly the, offers you the greatest level of control, but it can also be the most difficult. You might also want to consider just exporting, where you'll sell it to anybody, uh, any distributor or retailer, let's say it's a product in that market. You might also want to consider having a partnership with a distribution channel, hire a distributor to distribute it, and often, and that's actually a very frequent uh, market entry strategy uh, or tactic, and the, oftentimes the company ends up buying the distributor at a certain level, uh, at a certain point after the, they've, they've managed to have some penetration. You can also license your product, which is where, if it's a product, you're not even offering the product directly, you're just letting someone else manufacture it and use your name if it's a, if it's a recognized name or, or technology for that matter. 
You can also have franchises. This is more common in some of the restaurant businesses uh, where you know the, they're locally owned, but they use your business model and you make some money by um, selling them the, their equipment and their raw materials. For example, uh, if you've ever been to China, there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken now on just about every corner. It's actually bigger than McDonald's in China. Uh, you can also do a joint venture. This is oftentimes government mandated. We'll get that to that in the future, but you can you can sort of pool resources with the local player and of course you can also acquire somebody who's already there if they're in the right industry or if they already have some scale some momentum you can just buy them outright and uh, just as a final point on means it's important to note that oftentimes this is a uh, a balance between ease of entry speed of entry and control because the easier and the faster you get into that market like through an acquisition or a partnership the harder the less control you might have because you have a whole organization that's established different owners to to partner with uh, that you have to negotiate decisions with um, next let's talk about the organization that uh, you would be developing to, to sell into international markets um, one interesting point is you might say it's difficult to get your organization to react to the local market, but the research indicates that the opposite actually happens. What typically happens is uh, the, the people you put in that market, and, and there's a debate as to whether you should hire um, people from your country who know your business but don't know the country as well to go there and learn it, or whether you should hire people who are there and know the country to, uh, uh, to learn your business. Uh, and that's a that's a debatable point. But generally, if you send people there, they will or, or or make them financially incented for success in a new market, they will go native, and uh, you will actually have a harder time. You will have less trouble getting them to learn the market, and more trouble keeping them loyal to the the, the larger interests of the firm. Another point I like to make is that. Uh, even if you set, set up an international division or if you make people responsible for international sales, that having a division is not the same as having a strategy. And uh, that's some, if, you, if you don't have a, a thought out strategy, if you haven't thought about where your competitive or comparative advantages are and you just hire people to be in charge of it, they can easily end up very frustrated and you might not have very, uh, a great deal of success there. Let's, let's take some final considerations, uh, at least for the sample, in terms of branding. Uh, this is if you have a product or service you're bringing overseas. The first question is, do you need a global brand? I think there's an intuitive thing in business people. We like common practices, and so we always want to have the same brand everywhere. But it's important to note that most markets aren't actually global yet. It, maybe they are on the cost basis, the scale basis, but not necessarily the consumer basis. Most people don't actually leave their own country very often, and they only know the brands that are there. And so a lot of times, the push to have a global brand because you like the elegance of a homogenized brand is unnecessary and oftentimes costly. Good example of that is ni uh, Nissan, which used to have the Datsun brand, and they switched over to Nissan, and uh, it, it, it didn't, it didn't, it, they, they gave up on a brand that already had a lot of e brand equity to it, and some people would say they're still uh, living down the problems that that created uh, these many years later. Another thing you need to ask yourself if, if you're offering a product or service is how, how much do you adapt to the local market versus standardized? And this can go either way. This can be the, you can uh, adapt the, uh, pardon me, either way referring to the brand or the product service. So you can adapt the brand, go with a local brand, or if, you're, if you acquire someone, stick with their brand, but standardize the product. And that's a debate as to you know, what, what is the advantage of how much of a premium, how much more money can I make by adapting it to this market and making it more uh, easily received versus how much money do I save on the manufacturing side and the simplicity. You can also go the other way around. I think I said you can, you can adapt the brand and standardize the product or you can adapt the product but standardize the brand. So the uh, Buicks that they buy in China where Buick actually has a, a lot of brand equity interestingly um, because of some quirks of history, uh, they're oftentimes different models than the Buicks that you buy in the United States. And one last point on that, I wanted to mention that uh, Oftentimes, if you, my, one of my favorite ideas is even if you have a, uh, a brand that you acquire and so you want to have uh, adapt the brand, one brand in a foreign market, one brand in a national, you can oftentimes synchronize the logos. So if you do have an international advertising campaign, say you're sponsoring uh, soccer or football matches, that uh, people will recognize the label and, and know whichever brand uh, that represents in their own country. So those are some 
examples of where you're sort of going into a new market to sell into. There's also going into a market to buy from, this sort of a sourcing, supply chain, outsourced manufacturing kind of model. So let's talk about some of those issues. And by the way, like I said, these aren't comprehensive lists. These are just some, some sample examples. Um, but again, one of the things you want to ask yourself is what reason are you going into that? It, uh, most common probably is to reduce cost. Um, it also might be to, uh, because there's an expertise in that particular area. Some countries have almost arbitrary expertises. Uh, for example, if you want to build uh, speaker drivers, Denmark is like one of the leaders for that. And it's, uh, it's sort of an accident of history that they ended up that way. Um, you also might be going because a key supplier has moved overseas and you want to be near them or uh, the opposite, a customer has gone, has gone there and you are their supplier and you need to be lo located with them. And different reasons might cause you to do, uh, make different considerations uh, and different strategies. And I'd also like to point out that oftentimes when you go into a foreign country and you look at the cost or you pencil it out, it looks more appealing because you're using the assumptions from your domestic market. It's important to also remember that, you know, if, if this is your delivery time and these are your manufacturing assumptions, that when you get to that country, you might find out that things don't work the same as they did in your native country. So it's important to bear that in mind and, and do some sensitivity analysis to make sure that those costs aren't just uh, theoretical, but will actually work when you hit the ground. Um, also, the means of going into uh, another country, kind of analogous to when you're selling in, you can have, uh, you can do a wholly owned company factory. You can go in there, buy it yourself, own it yourself. You can also do contract manufacturing or supplying. You can again do a joint venture or or make an acquisition of a local player. Um, so remember, don't don't run in and assume that you have to do everything wholly owned yourself. There are a lot of options there. Um, the next two are sort of related. There's technology transfer, which is oftentimes regulated by the government. They'll force you to have a joint venture because they want to educate their own workforce and, and not just be manual labor, but move up into the engineering and design. And so they'll want to take some technology transfer. That's generally more in the government's interest than yours as a firm because uh, some of that might be proprietary and a competitive advantage and there's a loss in giving it up. And then there's also piracy. And I always sort of make the joke, technology transfer is basically legal piracy and piracy is basically illegal technology transfer. Um, last, uh, not second to last, supply chain and inventory management is oftentimes a consideration. Um, a, you, you might, uh, sort of as I talked about earlier, you shouldn't assume that the same assumptions hold. For example, if you're, if you're used to having your manufacturing in your native market and now you've outsourced certain components, contract manufacturing, whatever it was, you're, you're shipping them overseas, all of a sudden your inventory is a lot higher. And that means you can have more spoilage or, and it might take longer for you to realize that there are pro if problems occur in your supply chain at the at the at the uh, component manufacturing site, it might take weeks or de days or weeks until it gets to your native uh, site to realize that there's a problem there, and uh, all of a sudden you have a whole uh, ocean full of ships with bad components on them, and your your spoilage is a lot higher. So that's some things that you might want to take in bear in mind, and you might have to end up air shipping, which ruins your cost uh, uh, advantage. And the last one I want to talk about for sourcing is the regulations and standards. There, there are oftentimes different environmental standards and work conditions at other, company, at other countries. And I like to point out that these aren't necessarily, uh, oftentimes they're lower standards if you're a developed country going to a developing. Uh, if you're something like an, a, a, a lightly regulated um, industry in a something like an American, sort of an anti-regulatory environment selling into Europe, you might actually have more regulations on some of the uh, business practices. And that goes for selling into as well. There's probably stricter antitrust in some parts of the world than in America. But um, sticking to the uh, regulations and standards, it's important to note these aren't necessarily regulations or legal. Sometimes it's political activism. So for example, um, Apple t has been in trouble because the working conditions of their factories, which they don't own, they're contracted out, but uh, they've, not, they've not met Western standards of uh, uh, humane conditions and they, they get in trouble for that, even though they're not necessarily breaking the law. And it's also important to note that what, what the Western activists basically want to do, it, pardon me, the developed country activists, the political activists want, is to make sure you're not just outsourcing bad behavior to get away with it. So with that in mind, let's look, so we've talked about selling into, buying from. Now let's talk about sort of doing uh, work on the infrastructure specifically in another country. And let's talk about public works. 
And this is kind of a grab bag of things. It could be a capital project. You, uh, Enron, for example, built a power station in India and they had to deal with the Indian government to do that. You might be building road, bridge, um, or infrastructure project. You might also just be taking over an existing uh, 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 government uh, reg or regulated area, like uh, buying a phone system from another country or buying their uh, water processing facility or operate or going to just manage that operating facility. Oftentimes that happens when a country w uh, owns, nationally owns, the, the government owns one of those utilities and they decide to spin it out. And that's where you have to, and, and, and they'll allow foreigners to bid on that uh, to purchase it. Now, uh, we're gonna get into some dangers of that expropriating some risk, but it's also important to note that sometimes they like to outsource it because now that it's private, private companies can make tough decisions like getting rid of overstaffing uh, easier than the government can. Um, in terms of dividing risk, that, that's where the question you have to negotiate is, how much risk do you as a company take versus how much risk does the government take in that uh, uh, equation? And that, that example I gave you where Enron built a, an energy facility in India, they very cleverly, uh, for Enron, very cleverly got the government to almost assume all the risk, including some of the foreign exchange risk and some of the regulatory risk and tech, uh, technology risk. I mean, it's like, it was almost just a, a free money contract for them. and. Uh, that's great work if you can find it. If you're a government agent, that's not necessarily what you want to do. You want to make sure that they are taking risk for the companies investing, take risk commensurate to their profit. Now let's talk about, so those are sort of the different uh, industry models that you can run into internationally. Let's talk a little bit about some government issues. Um, first of all, they tend to favor local uh, manufacture, local businesses. And that can be uh, an obstacle. For example, one thing is they might make you do a joint venture because they don't want to see you run their local industries out of town. And that means you've got to split decision making. Another uh, example of this is when PepsiCo tried to buy Danone, the, Danone, the, uh, the yogurt maker, the French ruled, government ruled that yogurt is a strategic industry to prohibit that acquisition. So there, you get some almost comical um, instances there. It's also important to note that uh, or another good example is uh, when there's a Walmart went into China, as did Carrefour, which is a European uh, large retail chain, went into China. And Carrefour went in and developed everything quickly because they just adopted their European model. Walmart moved in more slowly, but they did a lot more local sourcing. And so a lot of the local governments who decide who gets permits and whatnot favor Walmart because they, they put more jobs in the community. And that's one of those uh, examples we talked about earlier with the balance between speed and uh, uh, sustainability or longevity, short-term versus long-term thinking. Also, government changeovers can be a problem. Um, if, if the, <laughs> oftentimes if you make a deal with a government and then they get voted out of office or overthrown, uh, they won't, the, the new government will say, well, that was, that, was, that was a deal you had with them, I'm not them, and, and, and that deal is no longer valid. And if you invested, they can essentially get, your, uh, get the benefit of your investment for free. Um, that builds, that flows nicely into my next point, which is about expropriation, which is where uh, the, the government might nationalize your business um, if, you, uh, if, if they think there's an advantage to it. That's particularly prone for capital projects. They feel very comfortable. They might not want to buy soda makers, but they might be very comfortable buying um, uh, utilities, bridges, things like that, infrastructure pieces. So they'll get you to fund it and then they'll expropriate it. And it's important to note that we oftentimes have trade agreements, free trade agreements, but trade agreements do not cover uh, what's called FDI foreign direct investment. For FDI being if you spend money to build something there, that's not, a free, that's not covered by a free trade agreement. Also, it's important to note, even if they don't literally nationalize it or expropriate it, they can oftentimes do that effectively. So they might not want title of your uh, bridge or your water processing factory, but they might decide to put a 95% tax on just facilities that, uh, just the facilities that you own uh, by writing the, the, the regulation very narrowly. There's some government risks. Let's talk about some economic risks. We obviously have some volatility and some uh, economic risk. It's very common to sort of think of that as an emerging market, developing market problem. But if you look at recent times and see what we have in Greece, Spain, or Ireland, you might see that that's not exclusively uh, a risk to emerging markets. Also, foreign exchange. This is uh, or currency. Uh, if the if the 
currencies are different, differently denominated. Um, that can have impacts on your business. For example, if you go into a company, uh, country because they have low cost, but then their currency appreciates, uh, effectively that cost advantage can go away. Also, the um, if, if you're a publicly held company and Wall Street has certain growth target expectations for you, if the currency goes up in the foreign country and you're selling into that and you're bringing that money back, that can actually boost your growth. You get a tailwind from that. But if the opposite happens, if, if your currency appreciates relative, relatively or their currency depreciates, you will, it will, even if you sell more, it will look like uh, the, do the, the dollars were less once you translate it back into your native currency. Whereas um, if, you, if, the, uh, if their currency uh, appreciates, it will, it will look like you had unusual growth. Um, the cost issue, the foreign exchange issue was a big one in Japan because a few years ago they were at like 120 yen to the dollar, a very generally weak currency, and now they're at about 80, and that has really wiped out a lot of their, because it's a large manufacturing uh, country, and, and that's really made their manufacturing uncompetitive. Uh, last point I want to make just for the sample is there's a big difference between GDP, and this is PPP for purchasing power parity. This is how much money is in the economy, but you have to divide that by the number of people to figure out how much money that they actually have per person. And p purchasing power parity also implies that they might have a different cost structure there. So a mistake you could make is say, oh, look, it's a big market in terms of GDP, or, but you didn't figure out GDP per capita. Or to say it's growing GDP, but if the population growth is comparable, it's not going to make them uh, particularly more wealthy. And it's also, but if uh, conversely, if the people uh, have a lower cost in that uh, part of the country, uh, pardon me, part of the world, they can actually buy more even if they're making less money. So GDP, even GDP per person can be a, mis uh, a little bit misleading. And the last one, uh, or pardon me, second to the last, that I want to talk about in terms of major issues, there's some cultural issues. So for example, if you have a language barrier, communicating can be complicated. And I always give a couple of tips for languages. The first one is, Oftentimes, we, we have what's called mitigated speech. We kind of put things diplomatically. It's important to understand if someone doesn't speak our language, they will be much more literal, not because they are being disrespectful, but because they don't have enough command of the language to be subtle about it. So in other words, instead of saying, you know, if we don't like something in America, we might say, perhaps we should consider doing something slightly different. Whereas they might say, your work is bad. And it's easy to be defensive about that, but it's important to bear in mind that that might be because they just don't know how to be more eloquent. Another thing is, uh, you know, we don't like to be monotonous when we speak. We try and mix up our word choices to sort of keep the audience on their toes. Um, but when you're communicating, and, and sometimes people even do that to show off how smart they are, they like to use big words. That's the opposite of what you should be doing when communicating someone with a different language because uh, the the they don't know all of those different variations of meanings and it's important to be um, the monotony takes a backseat to clarity so clarity becomes more important than uh, a variety um, also in terms of literal you should remember that expressions do not translate generally well because they don't so th they will only if you say you know you, you there's more than one way to skin a cat they will wonder why you're trying to cook a cat uh, and then the last point I want to make on that is um, it's very easy, if, especially if you're from a, a, a successful, uh, wealthy country, like a Western country, uh, doing business elsewhere, that you know, if you have better technology or better manufacturing and you realize you're ahead of them on the technical prowess, it's very easy to fall into a trap where you assume that therefore you know more about everything and you might be a better business person and you understand sales better. And that's, particular, and that's not necessarily true. A good example of that is, I think when Americans do business in Latin America, we oftentimes have uh, more advanced technology and so we assume that that knows better, uh, that we know better at everything. But if you look at actual sales and relationship management, other Latin countries are oftentimes better at that kind of thing than we are. We're a very sort of uh, cutthroat, to the point kind of culture. Same thing with some of the Northern European countries like Germany, whereas uh, Mediterranean cultures or Latin American cultures um, and some Asian cultures who place a high premium on fa saving face, they're actually more sophisticated in those areas than we are. And then I'll go through these quickly, a handful of miscellaneous ones at the end. Um, we've talked about this just sort of international, I've mentioned a few times, but whether you're going into an emerging market or a developed market could really change how you evaluate some of these factors. Also, we've talked about international versus domestic, but you oftentimes have to decide which market to enter, and that can be based on uh, hopefully which one's more profitable. Um, 
and, and to make that decision, you might want to weigh a lot of factors, not just big and growing, but also are there uh, competitive advantages or disadvantages? How well does your business model fit and how, would you ha how much would you have to adapt it? Um, also, we haven't talked much about professional services. I've, I've probably talked a little bit heavily on product, but this can be done for services in general. We did talk about like restaurants, but also professional services. There are some thoughts about whether or not professional services are, um, uh, they move faster or slow, they advance faster or slower in uh, new markets. Um, also, we didn't talk much about gray market, but that's an important issue. That's not black market because it's not stolen goods or illegal necessarily. But if people realize that you're selling something for uh, lo a lower price in a, in a uh, less affluent country than another country, they'll buy them here and then move them across the border and try and sell them elsewhere. And that's a real problem for some uh, countries. They also might under undermine your retail chain. And then the last thing is there are a lot of strategies that I can talk about. For example, if you're a Western country entering a developed market, do you want to take a premium because you are a Western brand and that's oftentimes given a premium? Uh, considered a premium product or do you want to try and go for the the mass uh, product by maybe making some adjustments or or accepting lower pricing lower profits and I also talk about the strategies that local players can respond with when you enter into their markets you know it's international to you but domestic to them and they can decide whether or not they want to carve out a niche that's more defensible or go after you directly and I address some of those so that's my sample presentation on international business. I hope you found this interesting. If you'd like me to present something like this to you at your event or organization, please contact me for a proposal at keithwhite.com. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.